Hi, this is David, and this will be part six of the Basics of Game Theory. And today we'll be talking about polarized ranges and bet sizing. Now, in the previous video, I said that when we have a range of hands and are faced with a bet where the opponent may be bluffing, we prefer that his bet be bigger. When he bets bigger, we make more money in our bet hands to bluff action, and with our very poor hand, we would be folding regardless of his bet size. Thus, our opponent's bigger bet sizes work in our favor when our range is strongly polarized between very strong hands and very weak hands. Uh, because our opponent's bigger bet gives him a worse price on his bluffs, we don't need to call as often to keep him honest or to prevent him from running us over. This allows us to have more bluffs in our range because we won't need to defend as much against his larger raises. Uh, thus, we need few value bets in our range to balance off our bluffs. But, and this is important, our opponent's bigger bets hurt us when our range includes medium strength hands that are really nothing more than bluff catchers when we're faced with the big bet. Okay, we, you know, in those cases we neither have a hand that welcomes the bets, nor do we have a hand that's an easy fold, so it hurts us. For this reason, we serve ourselves best when constructing our ranges to bet more heavily with very good hands, and bluff with poor hands, and not with new strength hands. The sample two-card poker game that I used to illustrate the point of how bigger bets from our opponents help us when we're defending optimally was not really a good example to use because we have a medium and bluff catcher. The bigger bet from our opponent works in our favor only when the bulk of our hands uh, consist of easy calls and easy folds. The opponent makes more money when attacking us with bigger bets when he has a polarized range, and he's attacking our range that includes many medium-strength hands. Uh, now we'll return to this uh, one-card poker game to show you what I'm talking about. Again, when we're using the optimal defense, the min-max defense, we look at the odds that our opponent would be getting on a bluff. We determine how frequently he wants us to fold in order to cross his zero EV threshold. We call the exact amount needed to meet this threshold, but not to exceed it in order to deny him profit on his bluffs. Now, in, in case number one, he was betting $2. He was making a pot-sized bet. He's betting one to win one. When he bets one to win one, his zero EV threshold is 50%. When, when we call 50%, uh, we deny him any profit. If we fold more than 50%, he makes a profit. Uh, thus, when he's betting this way, we can simply toss a coin or do whatever. We're calling 50% of the time, and that gives him zero EV uh, on his bluffs. Now, when he's making a bigger bet, suppose he's betting twice pot. He's betting four to win two. Okay? Uh, when he's betting four to win two, laying two to one, he now needs us to fold two-thirds of the time in order to make a profit. What this means is that without bluff catcher, we only need to call one-third of the time. Now, I made the statement before in the previous video that this was a good thing for us because it takes the pressure off. We don't need to call as frequently to keep him honest. Uh, we only need to call one-third of the time. And while that's true when we have a polarized range, it's not necessarily true in this particular case because in this case, we have a medium strength hand. Uh, we have a jack. And we're being attacked by a polarized range. We see here that our opponent can either have a queen, which is the nuts, or a 10, which has no value whatsoever and is a certain loss. And because we're being attacked with our medium strength range by a polarized range, the bigger bets favor him. Now, if it were truly the case that we would favor his bigger bets, then we would make more money or he would make less money when he tacked us with bigger bets. And it's simply not the case. And I'll illustrate this here. Let's take the first case where he's betting $2 into the $2 pot. He's betting one to win one. How does he do in 100 bets? Uh, we showed before that in 100 hands on average, player one makes 50 value bets. And he has his queens. Excuse me, the phone. Okay, I'm sorry about that. But anyway, uh, when he was betting optimally, he was balancing his, his range to have uh, two value bets for each bluff. So in 100 hands, he was making 50 value bets with his queens. Then with his tens, he was bluffing 25 times and folding 25 times. And this yielded a net of $150 per hand. He was getting this pro uh, per 100 hands. 
He was getting this profit regardless of whether player two always called, where he makes 50 value bets and he loses 25 plus, or whether player two always folds, where he's picking up uh, blinds, whether he has a value bet or a bluff. In either case, he makes $150 per 150 hands. And this is a profit of $50 per 100 hands after taking out the $100 ante expense. So this is a net of 50 cents per hand. Okay, I'll now go ahead and show you how when player one decides to make a bigger bet and he's betting twice pot, even though we have to defend less frequently, uh, he makes more money. Okay, so here we have our game again. Uh, but this time, player one is going to be betting twice pot. He's betting $4 to $2. Okay, now, what he does is he creates a $6 pot, and it's $4 for player two to call. Okay, so the optimal bluffing strategy for him is to have a ratio of value bets to bluffs, which is the same as the pot odds he's offering his opponent. Okay, he's offering us six dollars for four dollars okay uh he bets four dollars to win two but we must call four dollars to win six he's laying he's giving he's offering us three to two therefore he should have three value bets for each bluff so we're going to change this to 120 trials uh just to make things work out evenly and he'll be getting his queens half of those times so he'll be making 60 value bets with his queens now because he wants a three to two ratio a value bets to bluffs. He's making 60 value bets in 120 trials, and he'll be making 40 bluffs because when he gets his tens, he'll be he'll be betting 40 times and folding the other 20 times. And let's see how it comes out. If player two always calls, he'll be making 60 value bets and winning six dollars each time. He wins six dollars because when he bets four, and the opponent calls, puts it in his four. He wins the $2 that was in the pot, plus player two's $4 call. So he wins $60 six times on 120. He wins $6 60 times for $360. He loses his $4 bluff 40 times. So that he loses $160 there. So he comes out a net ahead of $200. And of course, if player two always folds, uh, 60 times to be making value bets, he picks up the $2 pot for $120. And the $40 that he, the 40 times that he's bluffing, he also picks up the $2 pot for, for $80. So he comes out at net ahead of $200 per 120 trials. So after the ante expense of $1 per hand, player one makes $100 uh, per 120 hands. Actually, he makes $80. That's a mistake. He makes $80 per 120 hands. And that comes out to an average of 67 cents per hand compared to 50 cents per hand uh, when betting only one to one. Okay, so now I have that fixed. Player one makes $80 per 120 hands after the ante expense of $100. And that comes out to 67 cents per hand. Okay, there are several things that we learned from this, both pre flop and post flop. And uh, basically, when we construct our range, which we'll do in the next video, we'll see that we're going to have uh, a few different classes of hands. Our premium hands will be our raise for value hands, but our second tier hands, which amount to our medium strength hands, we will not be raising with. They're too good. We'll be raising with our third tier hands, the ones that are almost good enough. Anyway, that's all for right now. We'll continue with more of this on roughly the same topic in the next video. See you later.